Hello UK Crime Book Club. I am absolutely beyond delighted to have HB Lyle with us. Um, you were going to join us last last week, the week before, and with software we had technical issues all of that week, so it just didn't happen. I got a week off, with, which was just more reading time really. Um, but would you like to say hello, introduce your books, and then we will talk about Wiggins and everything else. Hello, I'm H.B. Lyle, the author of uh, the first book here called The Irregular, which was published about six years ago. Um, my name's Ben, by the way, so Sam calls me Ben, uh, but H.B. Lyle is also my real name. Uh, my first name is, does begin with an H. I might tell you later if I get to know you better. But anyway, uh, <laughs> The Irregular um, is about the beginnings of the Secret Service, which was set up in 1909 in this country by a guy called Vernon Kell. And what I've done in my stories is I've taken a character from the Sherlock Holmes books called Wiggins, who was a street urchin who ran the gang of street kids that did a few errands for Sherlock Holmes called the Baker Street Irregulars. And I've grown him up to when he's about 30. He's obviously no longer a street kid. He's an army veteran. And he gets recruited by the Secret Service because, of course, he was trained by Sherlock Holmes. He was trained by the best. And he's got all those street smarts. And he becomes their first and greatest agent. Um, I, don't know, I won't go through all four, Sam. That's the first book, as I said, called The Irregular, which kind of is the whole origin story. And why we're here now this month is that the latest one, which is book four, called Spy Hunter, has just come out. And that that's taken up uh, to 1914, that one's set. And so the first one's 1909. We go 1910, the second one in London. 1912, the year of the gun. This is in Dublin and New York. And then 1914, Spy Hunter is in London and Europe. And it takes place in July 1914 um, and I think I can say it's in the reviews Sherlock Holmes has been the mentor figure of Wiggins for the first three books is murdered at the beginning of this novel. I did and wonder if you were going to say it or not but you well, right, it's not really a spoiler because it's it's so early on. Yeah it's the inciting incident of the story really that, that sends Wiggins into a sort of it's a revenge thriller across the Europe in the last days of the Belle Epoque, really. Um, and it's sort of the com completing of a circle of Wiggins going from that street kid in the first one, ex-street kid in the first one, to a kind of fully-fledged secret agent. Almost, It's almost a Bond-like mission, this one, but hopefully a bit funnier. <laughs> Definitely funnier. I can't comment on Bond. It's not something I was ever able to get into. These four books I absolutely love. So um, starting with Wiggins, I mean, what made you, I haven't read much to my, um, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to have to, haven't read any stories of Arthur Conan Doyle's with Wiggins in them. Um, so I don't know how heavily he features um, in the early oh, books. So how much did you have to kind of look at um, his character and consider what had gone before, before you could even start on this series? Uh, good question. Not much at all, really, because he only features in two stories. Um, uh, the very first one, The a Study in Scarlet, the very first novel, the Wiggins and the Baker Street Irregulars appear in that. And then in one of the only other novels, The, the Sign of the Fall, mm. which is what they're best in, they, they try and find a boat for um, for Holmes, a boat on the river. They're looking for the murderer. Um, so, and only very short scenes. He doesn't have a character. It's more the idea and the yeah. name. The idea that the, the uh, Holmes calls them the irregular division of the Baker Street operation, as it were. So it's more the idea. Conan Doyle is very good at... Um, creating characters and ideas of characters very quickly. Um, he's got a kind of almost a screenwriter's skill of being able to sum something up in a sort of pithy, almost pitchy way. So, for example, 
there's only really one paragraph about Professor Moriarty. Mm. But everyone kind of, and he's described so brilliantly, but everybody kind of knows him as this grand arch villain. And it's just in a few lines. I mean, Holmes calls him at the end of that paragraph, he's the Napoleon of crime. Oh, I've got it. <laughs> and in the same with Wiggins and the Irregulars, it's like they can go anywhere, see anything, and no one sees them because children on the streets of Victorian London was perfectly commonplace yeah. in the 80s. Uh, so I do use quite a bit of the knowledge of the Sherlock Holmes stories in the books, but more, and I use them as like one of the other historical sources. So it's kind of use them for fun rather than having to you know, go back to them for any detail, really. So I've kind of created him as an adult, you know. Yeah, was that quite freeing to have so little to go on? I mean, you're still kind of having to go along a certain feeling, I suppose, a certain vibe about the characters, but you've had so much freedom to do whatever you wanted with him. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was because it's not really a pastiche. So it's not like I'm trying to recreate yeah. Dr. Watson's voice or trying to do it. It's not about that at all. Really. It's about something. It's about the Secret Service and throwing this character in there. So in a way, it's kind of, yes, it's for him. It's all fun, you know, because uh, he's, he's a gutter class kid. So he's not even working class. He's even below that. And he's got this kind of double act with the, the, you know, the posh guy. He's setting up the real guy. So the Wiggins character is the freest part of it all, really. Because when you're writing a historical novel, obviously you have to pay as much respect to real facts and historical facts as possible. And so, but Wiggins is the fictional element within that. Hmm. It's a so, really, really clever thing to do, to find somebody that is established by name, but there's so little known that you can really kind of make in your own. Well, it, it's not my trick, I have to say. Uh, it, it, one of my favourite books when I was a teenager was a series of books called The Flashman Novels mm. by George MacDonald Fraser. And the trick that he did, I think the first one was written in 69, I think there's 12 of them, and they're like historical adventures. And he took a character from Tom Brown's School Days, which was the you know, massive novel of the 19th century. Our ideas of what public schools used to be like come from that book, you know, from rugby school. All very posh boys going to chapel. But the best character in that book by far is the bully, who's Flashman, who's like a horrible, rancid bully character that gets defeated, you know, halfway through the book and gets expelled and everything and George MacDonald Fraser who wrote the Flashman novels took that character from the moment he was expelled from school when he was 17 and placed him in real history uh, as a and he becomes by pure chance a sort of Victorian military hero and it's all it's all a sort of spoof almost because he's he still remains a coward and a horrible person but no one notices and it was so that idea I got directly from that, like taking a minor character from a famous book and putting them into a real world. So I can't claim any credit for that one. You can't uh, follow um, the work, though. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, well, thank you. Well, the idea that I had, the, the sort of genesis of the Wiggin stories was, A, this is how long these things take. So in 2009, there was lots of, like, stuff in the uh, books pages and in the history about that was the 100th anniversary of the secret service in this country mm. as it's now confirmed they had a home bureau, bureau bureau which is now 90 it's now mi6 mi5 sorry and then they had a foreign bureau which is uh, mi6 now and so there's like centenary of it all and there's a big official biography official history came out and everything and that's when I thought, oh, I could write about that with this character growing up. This doing the Flashman character, doing the Flashman trick with that character into the uh, birth of the Secret Service. So that was the one idea I had, and I'm now four books in and still trying to exploit that one idea. <laughs> and doing it so well. Have you got um, more books planned? 
uh yeah it kind of depends on i mean as with all publishing it depends on whether the publishers want to publish it so at the moment i do have an idea for uh book five and i also have an idea for a sort of con contemporary spy comedy which is totally different so we'll see which one they want me to do really to some extent um but yeah wiggins goes on in my head he goes on maybe for another uh, 20 three. books no <laughs> as you pointed out so there are quite a lot of work you know when you're writing in real history you can't mm. you do have to look things up fair enough um Kaz says hello and why the interesting spies i am going to say um happy birthday to caroline maston it's her birthday today so happy thank you birthday. for joining us even on your birthday that is some commitment to the cause so uh sorry i can't why actually the see why the interesting spies she said well that came about uh, it was partly to do with the i this idea that i had you know so i wasn't so there's some spy fiction that i like you know most people have read a couple of john carrey and I, you know his two best books are brilliant books to my mind tinker taylor soldier spy and um the spy who came in from the cold but i didn't have a specific interest in spies and spy fiction uh until i had the idea for this book which was about 14 years ago now mm. um and then i always liked spy films you know where we were like spy thrillers and stuff like that um, but i didn't have a specific interest in spies and then i started researching this book and i just thought those things going together as i said the wiggins character in the, the beginning of the secret service um made me more interested and i suppose i am still interested in spy fiction and i think one of the main reasons is um it's sort of duplicity and stakes mm -hmm. and duplicity is always dramatically interesting when people are lying um or have to lie that always creates much more drama and interest and it doesn't have to be and then there's also jeopardy about spying as well people die or people get found out and so you can have those two things without having to uh manufacture action to go with it I mean, these books have a lot of action in but they don't have to have action that kind of you know fights and everything and chases to be exciting and dangerous um so yeah i guess that's what inspires i did really really love the action scenes though in particular um i'd say it's early on enough I'll I'll keep it vague. There are um, there's a specific scene where they're on a mode of transport and there's a, a fight scene and I just loved it. Thought it was absolutely oh. brilliant. I do love the whole excitement. I mean, there's so much glamour, but it's not always really as glamorous as it looks, which I thought was really cleverly done. Um, you've got all of the the other bits, you know, you've got the action, you've got the drama, you've got the comedy, as you said, different relationships running through, but I've got to admit, I love a good fight scene. <laughs> well, I was just actually on Twitter earlier, and a friend of mine who's a writer uh, was asking how do people about how to do fight scenes and stuff. Um, and thank you for saying you like them. Yes, that, that sequence yeah. that you're talking about, um, that partly comes from so before i became a writer or as a when i was becoming a writer and before that i worked in the film industry um for many years for a company called working title among others it's got a big film production company mm, i've seen lots make, of working title pictures yeah they make all the the um richard curtis films but they make lots of different kinds of films as well. and i used to read books for them to see whether they should be films and i used to read scripts and work on scripts for them and i do script writing as well and so I like good, I don't, I like good action in films too, you know? Mm. Uh, and so that's where that comes from about the urgency of it. And you can make it exciting. You can have a fight scene in specific locations and stuff like that. And, and I always try to do them with immediacy, the immediacy and the pace 
that you would expect in a film sequence. Mm. You know, so so there's a little bit of unreality about them, obviously. You know, if you watch a fight sequence in a film and then you read the newspapers, as I do, about violent altercations, it's normally like one punch and someone fell over and knocked their head on the curb and they're really badly injured. Mm. You know, it's not... So we don't write real action like that, but you want to be able to give the feel the real. Um, and, yeah, this latest book in particular uh, kind of has about three or four set pieces. And I realised once I'd finished the book that I think a lot of great uh, action books, you know, books that have action in them, there's not actually that many. It's not like you, you need to fight every five pages. What you actually... I actually enjoy it. it's kind of a set piece like a like a Bond set piece or Jason Bourne set piece and films have they edit them out they have about four or five you know they have those the filmmaking process for say a Bourne or a Bond film they would have those sequences before they finished writing the story because it takes ages to plan them and to get the location and all that kind of stuff so they would know this is the Waterloo Station sequence or beginning of the latest bond this is the chase sequence at matara is it matara in southern italy you know so mm. and i think that's a really satisfying way of doing it I and mean, you look back and you you read it and you get the experience of watching the film it's like action-packed when you were on a roller coaster and actually you can cut it up distinctly okay there's this one this one you know one here one here um but before i forget I was, um, what you said there, that was really pleasing to me about the glamour in the book, but the, the dark underside, because that was kind of what I was going for about the Belle Epoque, 1914, the golden age, as it would be in, mm. uh, in this country. Uh, and there's lots of literature and films and music. It's a bit wonderful place that was all destroyed by the First World War. And obviously the destruction, correct, it was due, but but, you know, there were lots of poorer people propping up that luxury, yeah. you know, for the, in all these beautiful places and everything. This whole sway of the working class. And, of course, the irony is it was most of those people that were also destroyed by the war and had nothing to do with it. So it's sort of... Uh, I wanted to show... That's why Wiggins... One of the reasons I was interested in Wiggins as a character, being from that that underclass almost they wanted to show that there's a flip side i got enraged and one of the other uh uh inspirations for the first book and the style of it was i got enraged by downton abbey uh, <laughs> <laughs> because because it, it kind of showed like it, that nostalgia sometimes it was i was all wonderful there and the it was just bad for a couple of the servants but the servants who were thieves or whatever, you know. And it was like, no, for most people, 1909, 1910, you know, was a really uh, sort of a life of backbreaking work punctuated by Sundays off and no holidays and not enough money, you know. It's not a picture we sometimes see. But so I wanted to set something on that side of the equation, but in an entertaining and sort of, genre satisfying way you know and Wiggins is really kind of um he's not easily surprised except when it comes to how some people treat women he's very respectful he doesn't he, he won't stand for things and he keeps an eye on people but the um the whole thing of seeing the world through his eyes so whether he's in a hotel whether he's in a brothel um, you know whether he's traveling somewhere he's you are seeing it through his eyes and obviously he doesn't have any of the airs and graces it's very realistic um well yeah that's the point i mean the point is so he's um and that this is especially true of the latest novel because uh well the latest two the first two are just set almost all are all almost all in london with a couple mm. of minor excursions so this one he sees a lot of europe um but his kinship with uh, with women is all, to me, the setup of the book is that Wiggins is the smartest guy in the room, pretty much always. 
but he's never going to get his boss's job. You know, he's never going to be the head of the Secret Service because of where mm. he comes from. You know, he didn't go to school, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he, it's, just, it's just a social impossibility. You know, if we think social mobility is bad now, you know, <laughs> compared to then. But in the same way, his sort of relationship in terms of his kinship for women rather than romantic relationship is that they are also in a subjugated position in 1914. You know, mm -hmm. they can't even vote, you know, let alone, do, let alone run for parliament or let alone be in charge of anything or uh, have a bank account, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so I think that's where one of the spaces where his attitude to women comes from. We're all put upon by, you know, th these guys and it doesn't matter like uh, Vernon Kell, uh, for people who haven't read the book, who's the head of the Secret Service of Wiggins, is sort of on off boss. His wife is quite a major character, certainly in two of the four books. She's I like Clemence own. very, very much. Uh, she's um, Constance, actually. Constance, Constance sorry, Clemence. Constance, uh, as, uh, and she's super smart and super funny. And obviously, she's very privileged in lots of ways because she's got, you know, she's rich and got a nice house and that but she's still for wiggins she's still got more in common with him than mm. kel has because it doesn't matter how smart she is she's not going to be running the country or anything like that even though she should be or you know so it, it's kind of all the outsiders in a way are all the smart ones in this uh, um and they're sort of fun to be had in that as well you know i think Constance is meant to be quite a funny character but the humor in her is humor at other people's expense you know not at her you know it's how mm. she's how she's smarter than people that are meant to be her betters um but yeah well all, and the other thing in that terms of how the, the women are depicted and how Wigan sees them it's I wrote a piece in the paper like six, five, six years ago, and the first one came out, about how there weren't many working class spies in spy literature or in MI6, you know, either in reality or in fiction. And so Wiggins was filling that, that space. And in the a, in a same way, you know, historically, female characters uh, in a lot of the literature I read are kind of ciphers or motivations for male characters in you know even good books great books you know i love john the carry but he doesn't write women very well they don't seem like real people and they rarely have agency of their own compared to the male characters and that's partly historical but it's quite difficult to authentically write uh, a female character in sort of spy space that would like have a job as a spy in 1910 i mean it actually does change in the war quite a lot there's lots of mm. females great but but you but i felt it's important to not to manufacture that but to you know when you try and write a book and write a new book you want to try and do things you're that exploring it aren't you exploring what the possibilities could have been yes and you want to do things that you haven't seen done before or you know, people I'm sure have done before, you know, they've had all this before, you know, some of your, you know, viewers, whatever, might might say, what about this, what about that? But in mm -hmm. terms of my sort of reading, well, I haven't seen that many. Like I say, in the first book, Constance is a suffragist. And when people first started re reading it, they're like, oh, she's just like, uh, they think she's just like the um, the mum in Mary Poppins, Glynis Johns, I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah, that's slightly silly, blah, blah, blah. But it turns out not to be because that's the whole point we want to show different aspects of um the things that we don't know that well so it's not that much of a spoiler in book two constance has quite a big role in the book two is called the red ribbon and she learns jujitsu and lots of the suffragettes did learn jujitsu there was a jujitsu bodyguard uh for one of the Pankhursts, and there was this woman who was like four foot nine, I think she was, Edith Garode, who taught them all martial arts. 
And I hadn't really seen that before when I was I was researching it. Like, oh, what did the suffragettes actually get up to? How violent were they? And all that. So, oh, and found out all this stuff. And it was like, wow, that's great. Let's have yeah, let's have one of the characters do that because that's quite cool and not something I've ever seen. It is really interesting how you balance um, facts and fiction because you are using real things and people from history. And um, it was really interesting to see because some of it, I wouldn't be able to tell what was fact and fiction. It might be something I didn't know. So I've learned quite a bit and things that I maybe wouldn't have known about um, Sherlock Holmes, for example, little bits and pieces that you kind of wonder what's you, what, what was in the original books. And it's so cleverly woven together that you're just reading the whole thing and you don't you don't really stop to think about which bits of history and fiction until you actually finish the book and sit back and really think about what you've read. So there is a good balance though, isn't there, of both? Well, hopefully, hopefully, uh, and it's different in different books and done slightly different way in this latest one, for example. Um, I don't want to mislead anyone, yeah, but it is a fiction, you know. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. it's, a fiction. it's got a Sherlock Holmes. And it, in it read like a fictional story. You know, it's a story. You know, you're not bogged down by any details at all. It just adds to the flavour of the story. But I like. I, I mean, I, that, again, going back to those books, the Flash books. I love. They used to have footnotes in them. This is the age before the internet, so you can look up and say, "Oh, right, that was," you know. And in the same way. Um, I love the idea of people Googling things, you know, like, oh, did that, did that was that real? Or did that person really say that or something? And uh, finding out that, yes, they did, you know, or whatever. I tried to be, I do invent things. Obviously, everything to do with Wiggins is invented. Mm. But, um, for example, uh, there's a, a, real things I, I try not to, you know, I don't say when something's happened, genuinely happened, I don't then change what, what has happened into something slightly fictional. So I know that, yeah. that's a real thing that did happen. Um, but also I like to steal things. So Churchill is a character in three of these books and he's in this latest book. And I obviously I write a lot of his dialogue in, you know, it's invented, but I often don't do that or I might, put words into his mouth that he's written down, you know, like in his diaries or something, or a letter to uh, his wife was called Clements, I think, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Clemmy. Uh, he, he wrote he wrote things down, like, oh, I'm, so at the start of the First World War, one of the things he wrote down, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it was something along the lines of, it's going to be horrible, it's terribly, um, I'm really excited. Does that make me horrible? sort of thing that was his letter and so i worked that into the dialogue so mm. it helps give us some authentic authenticity a it was something he was definitely thinking and b you can kind of use the phrase and, uh and it's it, it's that sort of thing it is hard work but also but it does um give you lots give you ideas as well so it's helpful as well as being hard work so, like, when I'm constructing a narrative, I need something exciting to do. What are they going to do here? Where is this going to happen? And then you can look up. Thankfully, the internet now exists. So all historical novelists are so much, uh, have to do so much less work than they can do. Although now everyone can check their facts in a way that wasn't true before. But uh, it can be good. They, they can help us, like, staging posts. It's like, oh, okay, I need to this kind of thing to happen what was going on then what was going on in july 1914 i mean kind of easy that one but what was going on then i could oh wow they could do that wiggins could sort of be a part of that in some way and so bingo i don't have to think about what that thing is i just have to you know manipulate my character through that setting or through that event um book four this book is slightly different it's got a in the sense that it does have a separate voice in it uh, for those yet to read it, which does give you a kind of day-to-day, -day, very brief day-to-day -day of what was happening in Europe from, I think the, the, the book starts the, the, in the 
Archduke Franz Ferdinand's assassination. And sort of the count of that is the first mm. page in a sort of more a voice that is as truthful as I can be. And then obviously most of it's the Wiggins narrative, but I drop in kind of what was going on because um, for those of you that don't know too well the origins of the First World War, it's kind of crazy how it went from like nothing to bang. Mm. It took about a month, about 42 days or something like that in total before it was just full on no going back. And it's a little bit frightening to think of when things happen here, you know, when um, Putin invaded Ukraine. So it's a big news story that you think. And I was thinking about that when I was well, like, oh, could that just go, you know, could it be mm. four days before we're all doing it? Or, you know, in Gaza. So it's quite interesting to see how that happened then. And hopefully it won't happen like that again. It is interesting that there's so much information about 1914, but you just have to pick a few words here and there. There is so much that you could have used and to just know when enough's enough, to just give a taste of kind of what's happening in any given um, any given era. You know, that, that's such a skill to have. Well, or it could just be that I'm lazy. <laughs> just mag magpie pick 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 bit um yeah but i it, well i would say i am a bit lazy in the sense that especially after first so i uh i don't know how well uh your viewers sort of know about the publishing industry but the so the first book took ages to write Mm. And, and, get, and those questions are really very pertinent. How much research? How, what do you need? Them? Because and you don't know whether that's going to be published. So you've got to write the whole book and then you've got to pitch it to an agent and then the agent pitches it to publishers. And is this going to be made? But then when I, that first one, they, they bought three books. It was a three book deal. So they buy the one, they publish it. And in the meantime, you can get on with writing another one. And so the process there is incredibly different. Because A, you've got one that's worked. So it's, oh, that kind of balance. So the B, so the second one, you just have to work on the story and the new characters and the plot. And then you can, and then you know, so, oh, I'll pick that out. I'll pick that out. I use that. This is an amazing sequence. I use, use that. And it's a sort of very, um, it, it, what the impression that you want to give is that the person who's written this book, has like read 50 books on the period and done an amazing amount of research. But actually, if that, that's not really the case for me subsequent to the first one, because A, research for the first one feeds into all the others. Like I know so much now that I didn't before really about mm. the Abordian period, 1909 to the war. Uh, so you can feed all that in different times. That's fine. And then and then it's a lesson that newer writers learn that less is more for the research you know you say for every five ten facts you use the good one and leave out the rest and and it, obviously you do with that reading because it helps you give a sense of the time but most of the reading i actually do when i research these books is fiction mm. contemporary fiction rather than because i enjoy reading fiction uh, more than history but contemporary fiction yeah rather than um history and also the internet does help you massively to check things as well so you can pick something out and is that really true and it can only it can take 10 minutes to check and maybe it's not true and maybe you click on a link you know via wikipedia through to some uh, and find something that's even better or a bit or slightly tweaked or something like that. It's quite a quick feedback system, I suppose. We've got um, a couple more hellos here. Um, Malcolm's saying they certainly need to balance the research with the content. Yeah. Um, Malcolm Hollandrake is an author. And um, Sarah, hello, Sarah. Um, I do have a research question. It's a bit left field, but um, I'm going to go with it anyway. 
were there any places that you were surprised by when you were researching if you hadn't been to them? I went to Paris a long time ago and was really stunned when I walked past the Moulin Rouge. Um, I just didn't go in, toddlers with us, you know, it was like yeah. I say, quite a long time ago. But I was really, really surprised. Have any of them had that kind of impact on you when you've researched them or visited? Um, okay, so the thing that definitely had the biggest impact on me and kind of essentially set in train the plot of the first two books was it wasn't a, a place. So the, the first two books, so I'm a Londoner born and bred and not not many of us are <laughs> born in london but um so i know like i like to think i know london really well and i've always mm. gone on foot and on public transport that so there was nothing about london that surprised me because part of the reason for the books was to sort of get out that quirky knowledge of the place mm. but so it's an event that surprised me more than anything else it's called the Tottenham Outrage, and I can. It's not spoiling the book. It's kind of the incident that sort of sets Wiggins on his path of joining the Secret Service because he's not the type of person that wants to have a job for official government for the government. He says, "I don't do official." But this thing happened in 1909 in Tottenham, and what happens? Two guys who turned out to be sort of Latvian anarchists stroke terrorists stroke part of a bigger gang um stuck up a payroll it's a payroll robbery out of a factory payroll in tottenham in the afternoon actually it was the morning like 11 o'clock in the morning or something um and they had semi-automatic pistols lugers and they held up the payroll and then they escaped and they were followed by a crowd that grew bigger and bigger. They were followed through Tottenham, across the marshes, onto a tram and off again. By like hundreds of people started following them. They were unarmed. It wasn't a chase, it was sort of like a walking chase. And these guys ended up, um, they shot a couple of people, shot them dead, they shot a policeman, everything. And all, a ma massive thing. And I was like, uh, I won't tell. I won't tell uh, any potential readers how that particular yeah. case end. But it was like it was so reminiscent of the tourist, the terrorist attacks we've had in London. Certainly, and they had them in front, you know, just on the streets, yeah. where people gunning down people, uh, or running over them and stuff. I'm like, wow, I've never even heard of this. What happened? It was amazing. It was like a million people went to one of the funerals, and it was it was just this huge terrorist attack on the streets of London like a hundred year almost a hundred years before 9-11 or before you know 7-7 in London or anything I'm like wow why did I not know this and that subsequently provides the one of the major plot drivers one of the characters involved in that gang is who Wiggins is going after and culminates in book two with an event I did know about a little bit about mm. called the, the Siege of Sydney Street, which was when 20,000 army and police besieged a house in Stepney in East London that had two, again, Latvian anarchists, the, the remnants of this gang that started with the Tottenham Outrage. Um, uh, and there's newsreel footage of that and everything. Churchill turns up, he was the Home Secretary at the time, gets his top hat shot off. There's only two guys, but again, they had all this ammunition and semi-automatic pistols. But so, yeah, so that was the biggest surprise. As I said, that was a surprise big enough to kind of drive two novels worth of story. One of the things that I wanted to ask is about social media, because with the the um, the words, even the blurbs, you know, the certain wording that Facebook, for example, doesn't like, you know, I've um, read something today about an author who's, constantly been banned from Facebook because his books are thrillers with things like um, the words terrorism and you know things like that and this man has been blocked many many times have you faced any difficulties with social media or is it not really something you've come up against uh, I'm gonna say it's not really something I'll come up against I'm not on Facebook yeah uh, so I never I managed not to join when I don't know when it came 
I was in my twenties or something when it came out. So I didn't, um, uh, didn't join. Um, so I'm only really on Twitter, which now doesn't block anything. So <laughs> now that Elon Musk's in charge, I think you can literally say anything on that site. Uh, but no, I haven't, I haven't even heard of that, to be honest, Sam. That's quite interesting, like keyword searches and stuff coming up against that. Um, We've I had presume... some really silly ones, to be fair. There's been some comments that are kind of, um, I can't think of an example, but something that might be just a common phrase in one part of the world or one small area of the country. And it's something that you just can't say. You just can't say some of these things that really don't mean what they sound like you mean. I wish yeah. I could give you an example off the top of my head. Um, I'll have five yeah. after we're done. <laughs> um, no, I've never heard of that, to be honest. I mean, I, I would hope that I'm, you know, published by a traditional uh, big publisher. I would hope that they would know about that, you know, more than more than me. That's one of – I'm not particularly good at promoting the books. It's part of – the what the advent of social media did do was put so much of that work – back on the author you know like you can yeah. you and authors feel that they should do that to help their publisher and they have to you know and then also the publisher we well, have to do it. we can't do that for yourself but personally i would uh perhaps prefer the day in terms of the book the publishing side of my career i prefer the days when you know you get your books reviewed in the newspapers and the company the publisher gets them into the shops and the supermarkets and that's you know you might do an event here or there, but that's you done. Because although I've got very interested in people buying my books, I'm not that interested in working out how to sell them. <laughs> Perhaps the personality flaw. I'm kind of more interested in like trying to write exciting books, uh, exciting and interesting books. And mm. um, as soon as it's done, I'm kind of want to work on the other ones. Yeah, no, it's fair enough. I am now slightly worried that the, the person I followed on Instagram might not be you. Have uh, you set oh, well, up I did, an Instagram? Well, I, I did join Instagram about, about a week ago, yeah. Because okay. I've got to... The, my American publisher wants me to do a little film, uh, like a little video, because the book mm. comes out in America in January. So I said I would do that, because you've got to show, you know, you've got to help. So I'll I'll do a little talk for that. So I thought I'd try being on Instagram, but I don't think I'm going to be on there for long. Kind of does my head in. Looking at it on my phone, it's like, oh, these films are popping up with images. I'm kind of better with words. Uh, yeah, so they're sort of... I read a piece in the paper once uh, years ago, like by all the, the tech billionaires or whatever, or the people that invented and work in... Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, mm. about how they use their product and how they let their kids use those products, and they barely let them use it at all because yeah. they know that they're really bad for you. So, yeah. um, obviously, kids and adults is different, but and you know, developing kids, developing brains. But yeah, you know, I, I sort of I do go on Twitter despite wanting to go, on, not wanting to do it. It's fair enough. I know for a fact if I didn't do this and need kind of, you know, um, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, Blue Sky, if I didn't need things like that, I wouldn't have any social media. It was quite a relief when my children weren't interested in most social media. You know, that was that was a real win. That's, well, that's yeah, a, that, to me, I mean, my kids are only eight. That's a massive win. I, I, th I think when it all first started, I think it was a bit of a wild west for kids. So I think the kids who uh, a certain age, older than mine, were like a bit unfortunate because parents, no one really knew how addictive, all these different things with yeah. it. It's just, oh, you're just on the computer for a bit. I think people are a bit more aware now, uh, you know, about how dangerous it can be and, you know, for self-image and all that kind of stuff. So. I don't, I'm sound like this is a sort of anti social media rant. I don't mean that. I, uh, they're very, they're, they're designed to be addictive and they're designed to give, they're designed for you to give them free product, free content, and to keep you pressing and looking. And it's obviously not very good for you on some level. But I say with the, um, 
the self-image thing, it takes a while to get used to seeing yourself on camera, but then there is nothing that's more of a leveller than when your friends start taking a screenshot of you when you freeze in a funny way. On a, So I'll be doing an interview and Kaz will message me a, a frozen image of myself and the face I'm pulling will be ridiculous. You know, like they say that um, actors don't like watching themselves back because looking at your own face, it's very unnatural seeing what your face does. It's a very odd oh, thing. Yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's horrible. I mean, to be honest, I, I don't look at myself that much, so I'm never surprised that much. It's more, it's more my voice that gets me. I don't sound, I don't sound anything like uh, I sound. If that makes sense. So that's always disconcerting. Um, but then you know, I haven't had that many people say stop talking like that. So no, I think you've got a great voice. Um, Sarah has asked, how do you keep track of your characters? um that's i suppose that's a, that uh, that's a good question i suppose it's easier with these ones because it's kind of all driven through the main character mm. and wiggins is the one i'm inventing so i kind of if i don't know what he's done previously if i forgot you know the whole plot of the book that would be quite tough but and then the other main characters, one of them's historical, so I kind of know where he, you know, I don't do anything, I don't make him do stuff that is all historically provably wrong. So I can mm. actually just look up the history. And now he's got so Churchill's in it a bit, Kel. Kel, um, I like Kel. Kel's an interesting character. But the, uh, thank you, yeah. But the, the flip side to that is, I'm sure there are mistakes and, Conan Doyle himself was famous for forgetting the details about his characters because he didn't really like Sherlock Holmes stories that much or he didn't care that much about them. He was much more serious about his historical novels. And so there's a whole subculture, sub-literature of people who write about Sherlock Holmes as if he's real. And one of the funny stories about that, um, for most of the stories, Watson was injured he was injured in afghanistan uh in the war there but for most of the stories it's his thigh that got injured but in some of them conan Doyle forgets that and says it's his shoulder and <laughs> so all these theorists are like oh he must have been shot bending down so the bullet grazed his shoulder and hit his thigh to make it still be true um and you know he even gets mrs hudson's name one once wrong he calls her mrs turner um because he just doesn't because he just didn't care that much so hopefully i'm a bit less slapdash than he is. Um, <laughs> but also i mean admittedly that's hard for him because it's like 57 short stories when you're writing a novel um it's so easy to check and if, if you're if you're not sure but i'm mm. sure there are mistakes anyway yeah. or more likely as well possibly repetition you might give someone exactly the same line of dialogue by accident. And you know, if someone was checking up on you, rather like uh, Sam's so-called friends who sent them <laughs> sent her pictures of herself, uh, someone might check and go, oh, they said that twice. That's really bad writing. And, you know, I'll hold my hand up to that. I read, um, I wasn't sure whether to mention this or not, but you, you just kind of touched on it. So I think I'll, I'll, um, I'll go straight ahead. I read an article by um, Lucy Worsley today and she was saying in it that it seems that um, Conan Doyle was not a fan of Sherlock Holmes because it took the eyes away from the rest of his work, which is what you've just said. And her opinion from things, um, you know, the research that she's done is that he really just kind of hated Sherlock Holmes. Uh, yeah, I would, I mean, one sense, so she hasn't discovered that's kind of like well known in sort of mm. Holmesian circles, as they say. I only learned but, that today, though, from Lucy's article. So I know she's kind of looked at other things to um, to reach that opinion, but I oh, yeah. never heard that. Oh yeah, well, because the, the, one of the strange things about Sherlock Holmes as a character, um, he just became massive. After the second story, he became massive in a way that's really kind of unpredictable. Mm. And it's sort of, 
there's not that many other characters you can, there are some, but just become so much bigger than the person who wrote them. And, you know, people instantly wanted to make plays and then as the filmmaking began and they wanted to make films of him. Every culture, yeah, it was it was sort of a weird thing. He's a weird character like that. Mm. And because in because someone's a very simple character, but it just captured so many people's imaginations. And when when he killed him off uh, at the end of the eventually Sherlock Holmes, um, the newspapers put black borders on the papers in mourning. People went into the city with black armbands. Wow. It was just like so massive and he killed him off because yes he was to him it was too distracting you know so he basically became dwarfed by his creation you know so i think rather than hated him i don't i mean lucy's a historian she'll know much better than me but i think he came more to resent resent the success and the fact that all anyone ever cared about conan Doyle really was he created sherlock holmes which is obviously a bit distressing for him, but on the other side of the coin, it's like, yeah, but you created Sherlock Holmes, a character that is still world famous over mm. 120 years later, you know, it's like, uh, and still being written about and still making films about, it's kind of weird. So it's almost like it happened to someone else, you know, it's almost one of those characters that almost kind of, as soon as they're on the page, they belong to other people. That's such yeah. a good way of looking at it. Did you have any reluctance at all using um, characters that were well known? Um, and people, no, not really. And people as well as characters. Um, I sort of absolved myself of all moral responsibility when I put Wiggins in the historical novel. So, you know, it would be a very odd reader indeed who thought it was anything other than fiction you know because like mm. Sherlock Holmes everyone now knows that Sherlock Holmes is not real so um so it's like okay I'm not really cheating anyone here it's not like I'm not doing a historical recreation so in that sense uh, I didn't feel too bad about it I mean it's quite a long time ago as well you know so I mean, the biggest liberty I've taken is with Constance Kell you know she's kind of totally my creation other than being married her name was Constance and she was married to Kel. But whereas Vernon Kel, I have him do a lot of the stuff that he really did do. Mm. I've still create him as a character, but, you know, he's grounded in a job. The offices that he works from in the different story are where he worked and stuff like that. But her, she was, she's written a diary, which I read. It was unpublished when I first read it. It's in the British, Museum, British Library, but it's now published. And she was a very different kind of person much less interesting to me you know she wasn't mm. a suffragette she didn't help inspire she wasn't this active you know she was a good military and government official wife who you know did all those normal things expected of her and backed her husband up and everything and i much prefer wives who do not back up their husbands and everything because that's much more fun for everyone definitely it's a nice thing when you're at home but it's um, definitely no fun in a book no, exactly. <laughs> um, we are almost out of time. That hour has absolutely flown. Um, I want to ask you one of my favourite questions because I just have really got no idea what your answer is going to be, which I quite like. Um, for memorable moments for you as an author? Um, well, that is a good question. I mean, because my publishing career so far has been sort of split by COVID, you know, which was so mm. different. Um, so they're all to, they'll all be to do really with the uh, probably the publication of the first book because it's such a special moment mm. so I remember the launch party for the first book was in the LRB big bookshop just by the British Museum that a friend of mine organised and it was a bit like a wedding <laughs> like my partner said oh, it's a bit like we're getting married because there was loads of people you knew from all walks of life, many of whom didn't know each other, you know, but all the friends and family and that kind of stuff. And everyone was either coming up to me or her congratulating us, like congratulations, all that kind of stuff, blah, 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 blah. 
So that was incredibly memorable because also at that moment, you you have yet to be disappointed by either bad reviews or bad sales. So you've got, you're like, you've got the possibility of, like, oh, you know, this could sell uh, 100,000 copies. Book, book launch. Yeah, exactly. It's full <laughs> of possibility. So that was probably it. You know, uh, that's probably the most memorable moment was just going, launching the first book. That and getting the phone call from your agent to say someone wants to buy the book. Mm. You know, Hodder and Fans, it was, wanted to buy the book, wanted to buy it. That's a pretty special moment as well. And then they tell you how much money for, and it sort of deflates. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's watched and thank you for questions and comments. Um, thank you and thank you for coming back then after Tech Gremlins last time. It, um, it's been really nice to actually get an hour to talk to you. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sam. I really enjoyed that. I love talking about my work, obviously. <laughs> well, I spent a lot of time writing it, you know, so it's nice to uh, discuss bits of it with someone who's read it so carefully and has been so nice to me. We always like that. Do you want to give us um, a reminder of Spy Hunter before yeah, we finish? Okay. Yeah, so that's that's in hardback, and they're all they're all audio books as well, all four of them. I think the first three are all out in paperback, and I think they're very reasonably priced now on Kindle, and they're mm -hmm. still obviously the audio books as well. Um, I think you can probably buy the first three as a bundle. I'm not sure how they sell it, but you don't need to read. You can read any of them as standalone. Although Agreed. what I would say is one and two kind of kind of go together. So yeah. reading two after one is a good idea. But book three and book four or book one, you can start with any of them. And hopefully you buy one, you'll buy them all. Well, thank you so much. And um, I hope we get book five, book six, book seven and onwards and you come back and talk about every one of them. Thank you so much, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.